Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our session today. Um, today, we're going to be doing adjusting to thyroid cancer across the cancer care continuum. My name is Rachel Wagesbach. Um, I currently have papillary thyroid cancer. I'm 33 years old, and this is my first in-person conference. So I'm happy to be here. Um, all right. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alina Carr. Dr. Carr is a research instructor at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She received her doctoral degree in clinical health psychology from the University of Colorado, Denver. She also completed the Meaning-Centered Psychotherapy Program for Cancer Care Providers at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Carr has specialized experience working with cancer patients and their family members or caregivers across the cancer care continuum, including diagnosis, treatment, survivorship, and end of life. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm excited to be here today and talk with you all about different ways to adjust with thyroid cancer across the cancer care continuum. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. To get started, uh, just a couple of disclaimers. So uh, this talk is for educational purposes only, and I'm um, offering one approach to think about managing and adjusting to living with thyroid cancer. Um, what this talk is not is it's not a replacement for any uh, psychotherapy or mental health care or medical care that you're currently receiving. If certain questions show up, uh, throughout this talk, and you currently have established care with any of these uh, uh, healthcare professionals, please make sure to defer any questions to them. Uh, everyone's care is very unique and individual in nature. Uh, and then a little bit uh, about me, as, as Rachel had indicated, uh, I have a PhD in clinical health psychology from CU Denver. It's great that the FICA conference is in Denver this year. Uh, I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at North Star Psychological Services, and I've worked with a, a number of uh, different individuals with chronic health conditions uh, and more recently with thyroid cancer. So I'm really excited to be here to uh, speak with all of you. And uh, something I really want to emphasize throughout this talk is uh, there's many different types of experiences that can come with having a cancer diagnosis. So uh, I tend to have a very collaborative uh, talking style. So I'd like to hear from you as much as possible throughout this talk. Uh, so don't hesitate to use the chat feature for those who are here virtually um, or for anyone in the audience. If there's any comments that you have, feel free to, to voice them throughout and I'll do my best to keep an eye on uh, the chat box. Um, all right. So when we think about the cancer care continuum, uh, what I mean by that is anywhere from prevention all the way to recovery and survivorship and end of life. And what I've done here is I've taken what we tend to think of as the cancer care continuum and, and really adapted it to the thyroid cancer experience. So anywhere from um, those of you in the audience or here virtually today that may be uh, uh, undergoing screening and might be in the process of waiting for biopsy results where there can be a lot of uncertainty there to those who have recently been diagnosed with different types of thyroid cancer, whether that's papillary, follicular, anaplastic, um, or those who might be undergoing different types of treatment. Um, most notice, noticeably, uh, surgery tends to be the first type of treatment that individuals tend to undergo, but there are certainly lots of different uh, treatment approaches depending where you currently are in your journey. And as is often the case with what we see in the, the thyroid cancer community, uh, there's a lot of back and forth bi bi-directional relationship, as you can see right here, where uh, there tends to be a lot of recovery from different types of treatments that we may have. And we might go into survivorship uh, for a certain period of time, but there's fear of cancer coming back or other types of cancer may be showing up in your cancer experience. Um, or maybe there's worries about, I've just had my surgery, 
when do I need to go back to see my different providers or what's appropriate for long-term follow-up care or how long do I need to be on these uh, thyroid stimulating hormones? Uh, and there can just be a lot of nuances within the whole continuum that can understandably lead to different levels of adjustment or, or stress. So uh, I'm curious for anyone in the audience, whether they're at the Thyka conference in person today or those who are attending virtually, but I'm just curious, what areas of your life have changed after your diagnosis or treatment? Um, so I've included here one of the first domains being physical. Um, so some of those uh, I've listed here, but just curious if anyone has any others to add. And uh, don't be shy. Uh, uh, lots of people's experiences. Oh, go ahead. Um, sorry, we had the wrong microphone. Um, okay. I was going to say, actually, that list is pretty that pretty encompasses everything. But I have to say for me, once I got my diagnosis, everything changed to a way that my family functioned, to a way that every, I mean, literally everything, the way I, I'm used at work to everything, mm -hmm. um, whether it be physical, emotional, social, whether people would want to hang out with me after. It was like being given a punishment and mm -hmm. being put into a bubble and left there to just get better and nobody came to visit you. So it was like, what is going on? So I would say for me, life after diagnosis, everything changed. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, it's not just the, the physical, which is what uh, can tend to be overly emphasized. I have a couple of other uh, domains here as well. Like you had mentioned the social piece, feeling really isolated at times, not feeling as though individuals or family or friends are wanting to, to come to spend time with you, changes in, in work as well. Um, I'm curious with uh, feeling isolated, if part of that was uh, related to radioactive iodine treatment, I, oftentimes for individuals that have received radioactive iodine treatment, there is that two week, uh, depending on how your providers have a recommended isolation period where people need to stay inside um, by themselves. And there can be a lot of stress around the time frame and when individuals are able to uh, slowly start interacting with family members and safety around that, which can also add a lot of stress. Um, I've also included here uh, more emotional feelings that can show up. I've included uh, uncertainty about the future just not knowing is the cancer going to come back? Are there other things that I need to worry about with the next scan that I have? What will the results look like? Maybe feeling really overwhelmed. There's a lot of different uh, providers and appointments to try and manage on top of trying to emotionally digest uh, the diagnosis and where you are in treatment. And then uh, the social piece as well as uh, someone had mentioned in the audience, and thank you for sharing, um, feeling like there are changes in family and work roles as well. Um, and there's a huge financial impact to, we think about survivorship within thyroid cancer and needing to be on uh, hormone medication for the rest of your life and needing to follow up with different providers um, for different types of annual appointments, or if you're in treatment, having more of those subspecialty follow-ups. Um, uh, curious if anyone else feels comfortable sharing their, their own experience and what sort of things had changed. I have a, a few comments in the Q&A that I'll share, and I have a few more in person, so I'll let the in-person go first. Okay. I got diagnosed when I was trying to get another health issue diagnosed, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people who have multiple health issues so it can be difficult to determine what's associated with the thyroid cancer and what's everything else going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, that's often some things that I've seen in my work at Georgetown. I've talked to different patients who have said, actually, 
what we were able to locate the, the thyroid cancer because I was going in for a different type of screening or health procedure. So this was a, a massive surprise. Um, so having to try and co-manage other health conditions on top of this one. So there can be compounded layers of, of stress or anxiety or understandable worry that, that can come with that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, I go ahead. In my experience, um, I'm now on the 10th year out mm -hmm. from anaplastic thyroid cancer. So, you know, I was in denial the first year that I would not be able to go back to work and have a normal life and that I wouldn't just completely return to what I had before. So everything on your list applies. You know, I um, lost my social group because I couldn't keep up. Um, I can't be in loud crowds and, and be boisterous and I don't sound the same and they think that I'm in pain. So those things, but also when I did plan to go back to work, I eventually had to give up my job because the side effects from treatment, I went through times where I lost the movement of my arms. So 50% of people can lose uh, movement and have like, they call it like the morbidity. Mm -hmm. And so my shoulders froze, my arms wouldn't move, not, you know, on top of my voice. So then I was back in therapy and trying to figure out. So I had to then give up my job. So then you lose your, your work, your career, your social. And then I eventually had to move from the area because if I don't have the job, why pay the rent? And then you lose your whole city and you have to reclimb it, you know, to a whole different thing. So, so mine went through many stages of grief and kind of giving, and I still kept a beat. I looked for the positive, but it didn't mean that I didn't feel those losses and yeah. frustrations. Yeah. And thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, something that I really appreciated about your a journey and how you shared it was there can be positive in addition to these feelings of guilt and denial that might be showing up um, uh, for, for many individuals that have moved through cancer treatment and diagnosis, there can be a, a lot of what we call um, a growth that can, can come out of it. So not trying to negate any experiences that might show up where you feel like there's been a positive outlook on life, but at the same time, uh, this is a significant life stressor. There's many areas of our lives that tend to change, whether we're prepared for it or not. And you can be the most prepared person uh, and advance plan as much as possible, but there's a lot of uh, unpredictability about the future that can show up. Um, so I, I've really appreciated that uh, positivity that you've talked about, there are positive elements, but at the same time, it can be really hard to move through and just normalizing that experience. Um, also with regard to work and different role changes and needing to meet where your body is currently at, where your functioning is currently at, even if maybe your mind, uh, you might still want to be working and where you are in terms of cognition or being able to concentrate, uh, you might want to continue to move through that, but your body is telling you to slow down and that could be hard too. Um, I'm going to try and answer some of the comments that are in the chat really quickly. Um, so someone had mentioned uh, strange weight gain being an experience as well and physical changes in their appearance. So uh, hair loss and teeth loss during radioactive iodine treatment. Uh, some other people had mentioned uh, feeling really ex extreme low energy, uh, difficulties going up and down the stairs, doing household chores, showering, doing laundry, and all of these things taking up a lot of energy now. Yeah, so it, it really just echoing that it's, it can be really difficult to try and meet all of the different demands that maybe we've had before the cancer diagnosis or treatments and, you know, trying to come to terms or meet ourselves where we currently are at. Um, so I'm gonna move, move along a little bit. Um, 
And I think the bottom line is no matter where uh, people are in terms of their uh, diagnosis or treatment journey, um, having thyroid cancer comes with very unique experiences, feelings, and thoughts. And each person's experience with their uh, illness journey is different. So really respecting uh, how those things can look. And uh, if your experience is different from somebody else who's currently at the conference or that you know, knowing that that's okay. Each of us are uh, different individuals that have different lived experiences before uh, our diagnosis or our treatments. And those might be um, different beliefs that we have about uh, our families or it could also be different lived experiences that we may have had. And all of those things come with us into diagnosis. All of those things come with us into uh, treatment. And that really can change how we move through those experiences. So you know, just taking a moment to, to soften those differences and know that it's okay if your experience is different than the person sitting next to you. So this has been um, a really interesting uh, conversation that has tended to come up whenever I've interacted with individuals uh, who have been diagnosed with, with thyroid cancer, especially in the work that I do at Georgetown. I've uh, interacted with a bunch of different patients in some of the research studies we do, and they've mentioned uh, it's really hard when I'm being told thyroid cancer is the good cancer. And uh, I've worked in, in my career with lots of different types of cancer across the continuum. And it wasn't until I started working with uh, thyroid cancer patients that this is something that showed up. Uh, so when I heard that, it I had room for pause. Oh my gosh, uh, it makes sense why uh, different providers are using the good cancer in terms of you think about um, treatment outcomes and certain five-year survival rates, but it doesn't necessarily capture the impact of having cancer. So to, to be an individual, to hear that uh, you've been diagnosed with a cancer, to go through different treatment, to have all of those things that we talked about, if we think back to that slide about the physical, emotional, or social changes that have happened, it can be really hard to sit with what is currently on this slide. So I've been really appreciative of all of the different individuals that I've um, interacted with when they're, they share their own unique experiences. And also the stigma that can come with this term, the good cancer. I've had some people tell me in some of the research studies that we do, if you Google the good cancer, thyroid cancer is what shows up, but it's really hard when I've had changes in employment, when I've had to maybe delay family planning because of um, needing to move through treatment. It can be really difficult to have different conversations with my loved ones about uh, how me attending different holiday get-togethers or even going out to dinner might be challenging because of the different symptoms I experience. So it's interesting that that term's used and yet uh, I've taken a bunch of different uh, language that's tended to be used with thyroid cancer patients in talking about this quote unquote good cancer and here's a bunch of other terms that are used to describe the good cancer. So um, I just wanted to pause here for a moment and see any other reactions that people have had um, with this, this term, this label, and um, they can be positive or negative. I also just wanna respect everyone's experience too with what they share. Um, so anyone from either the in-person Thika uh, conference or anyone online have anything to, to share in terms of hearing this word and just your own personal experience as you've navigated through your own journey. Say so as soon as that slide hit the screen, my blood pressure went up. 
just seeing that statement. I've definitely been told that statement. Um, I had my husband's uncle said to me, oh, well, my mother-in-law had asked for a big prayer group to start praying for me. And he said, I don't understand what we have to pray for. That's the good one. It's fine. And I said, if it's so good, your kids can have it and I'll just live without it then. Like if it's that good, take it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a frustrating and it's, um, I don't know. I don't even have the word for how it makes me feel. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for, for sharing that. And also thank you for acknowledging what was showing up in your body too, as you saw that on the screen. Uh, Sometimes when we have so many different things going on in our lives and there's a lot of different stressors that are showing up and lived experience of cancer is a life stressor. It's really important to notice how, what our body is telling us. And in that moment, it sounded like you were recognizing, I saw that on the screen and my heart rate was increasing. My blood was boiling. Uh, I feel very differently or the opposite of what's on that screen. Um, so I also want to just take a moment and acknowledge uh, how you're l- really listening to your body in that moment. Um, but, but certainly when, especially around the time of, of diagnosis and then moving through different types of treatments, seeing how, how hard it is and, and it, it makes sense uh, in the human experience, we have different levels of suffering that we all go through and within cancer, especially it can be really challenging to, to manage both the emotional the cognitive, so different thoughts that show up uh, in the physical and social areas of suffering. But how can we think about ways to continue to thrive in life, despite knowing that um, part of being a human being is experiencing different levels of suffering? Um, How do we get ourselves back to this version where we really want to be thriving this best version of ourselves? Um, Any other reactions? or experiences. Hi, I'm back. Um, (laughs) One of the words I see up there is lucky. And that has been kind of my mission during this conference. I've spoken about it several times that I am grateful I don't have complications. I don't have recurrent disease, but I do not consider myself lucky. And I don't like it when people tell me, oh, you're so lucky you don't have all those issues. I can't imagine any child writing an essay saying, when I grow up, I want to be a cancer survivor. So yeah. we, and we, I know that later today, there is a session about lifelong management and monitoring of this. This is a lifelong chronic disease, whether, you know, it's a year or 30 and I am 30. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I, I really hope we can, just like we want to eradicate the good cancer, I hope we can eradicate lucky in terms of any kind of cancer. Right. Yeah. And and thank you so much for sharing that. And the lucky was, uh, should be quote unquote, uh, since these were taken from different research articles up there, but uh, yes, uh, certainly uh, almost having that the good cancer creates this um, sort of stigma around I should just push through these feelings that are showing up. I should just feel lucky or um, try to put my head down and, and keep moving. And, and it's really important as human beings to both process the ranges of emotional reactions that show up, but maybe frustrations too that, that can come into uh, these different uh, social concepts or constructs that can show up with the quote unquote good cancer. Um, and then there are some people, uh, in the chat who said, uh, I used to get angry with the words, the good cancer, but I realized that people mean well, but unless they go through cancer, it's really difficult for them to say the perfect word for each cancer patient. So now I tell, I tell to myself what other people say, it is none of my business. It helps me not to react. Yeah. So sort of finding different ways to depersonalized from comments that that are made. Uh, Oftentimes I've heard uh, uh, some people say, well, I'm told if I'm uh, 
feeling low uh, in terms of uh, both physical energy or maybe emotional energy from treatments. Oh, just have a cup of chicken noodle soup or something like that. And the reaction I've, I've tended to hear from different patients is uh, that's not it's not quite helpful, but I understand that the person who is offering that is, is trying to mean well. Uh, so those are certainly opportunities for different ways of uh, providing uh, boundaries with others where maybe they are trying to offer help, but it's not quite helpful, if that makes sense. Um, Dr. Carr, do you have time for another comment or two? Yes, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to say that I work in a doctor's office and five of the seven doctors in that office told me that it was the good cancer. Mm. Um, and I, I feel like my, the patients that I deal with were more sympathetic than the doctors have been. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding uh, your, your comments. So it sounds like in working in the doctor's office, uh, you've not only heard as an employee there, but in your own personal experience, the good cancer. And uh, having been diagnosed with thyroid cancer, patients are more compassionate and understanding. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it goes back to um, a lot of the, the stigma and the internal shock that shows up with, with hearing those words. And as we talked about a little bit earlier, the intent behind using that is more, oh, there's a lot of uh, treatments that can work well, but it doesn't take away from my life is going to change. My life has already changed. There's a lot that I need to move through for the rest of my life. Um, so good doesn't seem to fully honor or respect that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and was there one more uh, comment or question? Yeah. Yes. Um, in my experience, my when I saw my ENT and surgeon to plan the surgery, they assumed that I had papillary. They did not know. And although it had been showing that it was aggressive and growing quickly, um, he said it's the end of the year and all these people are trying to get their surgeries in. Um, because of copays. And so he said, fortunately, the type of cancer you have is very slow growing. So you're, you're, the, it's a lucky year that you got the lucky one. Um, so we can postpone doing the surgery for a couple of months. I insisted that I either get a different surgeon, somehow get the surgery earlier because it was growing so fast and they moved it up, thankfully. Mm -hmm. And then they discovered it was ATC, but you know, had I waited on the good cancer diagnosis and thought process, I might not have survived. Yeah, yeah, and and thank you for for sharing your experience and the vulnerability and sharing that too. Um, we we think about it, it becoming really important to self-advocate for yourself, or if you notice, again, going back to a comment I had before, um, internal reactions that might show up. Uh, so feeling like I, I still want to push through and, and prioritize my own wishes as a patient, which is to have the surgery as soon as possible. So there's a lot of different ways that we can think about um, coping with these challenges that can show up that we've all discussed. Um, so some of the things that I've seen are uh, some people tend to, to sleep. Uh, so rather than uh, you know find different ways to move through any of the challenges that show up, uh, there can also be this desire to go for certain comfort foods if we're feeling stressed or noticing different ranges of reactions. Uh, we might not talk about our illness to uh, certain people and, or, or we might talk to our family and friends. So the opposite of that. As some people, their reactions or trying to cope with these challenges might be to really bury yourself in, in your work um, or try to find different ways to ignore the situation. Um, so regardless of the ways that um, each of you might currently cope, what, um, 
sorry, seeing someone in the chat. Uh, when, we, when we live with thyroid cancer, we often face two major challenges. And one of those being, how do we cope with the practical challenges of following treatment recommendations um, or just following um, uh, different recommendations after diagnosis? And then the other side of that too is how do we cope with the feelings that come with these challenges? Um, so this often leads to feeling stuck, right? And I, I really love this visual of this tug of war rope and it's this internal feeling of stuck that we might have with ourselves. Um, so this feeling of stuck with this idea of who we were before our thyroid cancer diagnosis or treatment and who we are now. So who we are currently in this lived moment here today. And some of the things where we, we might be moving to and from with this uh, tug of war rope is the shock of diagnosis, the shock of treatment. And um, that can be interpreted as many different things such as how people um, in our family or friend group, or how uh, maybe the medical community responds to that, and then our own shock that comes with it. Um, so just curious, again, if anyone uh, has anything that they'd like to, to share in terms of ways that maybe they've initially coped, or these, this idea of feeling stuck with who I was before, and who I am now, and how this is constantly changing. And there's somebody in the chat um, who says, I do feel like I'm stronger than I thought I was. And uh, somebody else just said, I just had surgery and my vocal cord nerve was damaged, so I can't speak. Oh, okay. Uh, I think that was the person who was trying to, um, who raised their hand before. Okay. And someone else said, I have cope by sleeping, hoping that it was a bad dream. Okay. And I think uh, when we think about different ways of coping, um, really think, asking ourselves, um, are some of the things that uh, I'm doing, uh, how are they serving me? How are they helping me? And some different ways we can think about that is asking ourselves, how do we, how do I get unstuck? So Oftentimes I, I recommend really focusing on the, the here and now, the present moment, which is really hard to do, especially if we think about ourselves as, as human beings, just being inundated with different um, sensory stimuli, uh, different uh, stimuli all over. So it, feeling really overwhelmed by all the information that we're trying to absorb, whether it's about uh, and what is thyroid cancer? What does my thyroid cancer diagnosis mean? Uh, how do I prepare for treatment? How do I prepare for after treatment and uh, the recovery involved? Uh, what do I need to do in terms of my follow-up care? When should I go in for my next scans? Um, all of these things uh, that can really feel like they're sensory overload. But Coming back to the present moment, just focusing on the here and now can be one way to help cope with it. Um, and also knowing that you are different from the thoughts and feelings that you may have. Uh, so what I mean by that is if you're noticing throughout your own experience that there are lots of these thoughts showing up of uh, what does this mean? What if X, Y, or Z happens? I will never... Uh, B, X, Y, or Z, asking yourself, is this a thought that I really want to, to engage in? Is this a thought that would be helpful? How is it best serving me? Um, and noticing the difference between that versus sometimes the thoughts that we do have are really helpful. Uh, so for example, if uh, you're walking down a street and it's late at night and uh, there's a dark alley, right? Your your mind is telling you, ah, I'm gonna keep keep walking and maybe not take the shortcut. So there are times where we do need to listen to what our thoughts are telling us, but there are other times where you might notice certain thoughts that maybe create more feelings of stress or anxiety or worry or fear that are almost like a record player going over and over again and asking ourselves, 
you know, how, how helpful is this? We're not trying to change those thoughts that are showing up, but just noticing, well, if I start to engage with the thought, uh, how, how helpful is that? Um, so one way to do that is through mindfulness. And that's just another version of really focusing on the here and now in the present moment. So when I say mindfulness, I don't necessarily mean uh, the stereotypes that come with mindfulness. So if you imagine somebody on, uh, let's say, a beautiful Colorado mountain, since Thika is in Colorado this year, um, uh, sitting cross-legged and having their hands on their uh, knees, uh, and doing a lot of deep breathing for hours at a time, not quite what I mean. When I when we think about mindfulness, it can be really focusing on if, if you're walking, noticing how the pavement or the ground feels on your feet, noticing what's around you, really taking that moment to be present. It could also be um, if you're noticing moments of stress showing up, identifying five things in the room and really paying attention to what those things are. Um, other forms of mindfulness can be um, focusing on uh, deep breathing uh, and just for a minute or so and really taking a deep breath in, noticing your lungs fill up and then exhaling out. Uh, those are different ways to really recenter ourselves. And we also know that mindfulness, especially with a, a cancer patients, has been found to improve our sleep, helps increase our focus, and reduces different um, levels of stress and can relieve symptoms of depression and anxiety. So not saying go on top of a beautiful Colorado mountain and sit there for hours, um, Oh, just saying there's different informal ways where we can really get centered on the here and now, if that makes sense. And, and also being mindful of just tuning inward to the, our different reactions that are showing up. So creating the space and acknowledging or just being aware that there can be difficult thoughts or feelings that are showing up, but we're not trying to change them. So some beautiful comments that have been stated uh, both on the Q&A and also for those who are attending in person are, this is a really hard life experience. This is very stressful. It's okay that you're noticing stress is there. It's okay that you're noticing anger or frustrations there or sadness or grief or loss is there. It's okay. We're human beings. This is part of the, the lived experience but also not trying to, to judge ourselves for having those feelings that are showing up or these thoughts that are showing up or trying to change them. If that's what's showing up in the moment, just acknowledging. I'm really frustrated right now because I feel like my experience is not being taken seriously or I feel really invalidated in, in certain ways. It's okay to feel frustrated by that. And then do what matters. So really focusing on what's important to you. Uh, some different ways that can be helpful is thinking about, are there certain hobbies that you've really loved or enjoyed? Um, or even hobbies as a kid that you've loved or enjoyed and would like to get back to that are maybe age appropriate now. And finding different ways to tap into the things that give your life meaning, the things that you find really valuable. So that could be um, family is often something that I hear is a major value that people have, that connection. So is that spending time watching a movie with your, your loved ones? Is that calling a friend that you haven't talked to in a while? All these things that are in line with these things that are most important to us as people. Because this, the stress that the, the cancer experience is going to continue to be there. And we want to find ways to really ground ourselves in the here and now and that person that we most want to be. And here's a little cartoon that shows, are we being mindful or is our mind really full where we're inundated with all the sensory overload that just comes with being a human being? We've talked about different ways to manage 
the different emotional reactions that can come with the cancer experience. But there's also different ways to manage the practical and supportive needs that, that can show up as well. So what I've found in a lot of the work that I do at Georgetown is uh, many, many patients with thyroid cancer have expressed feeling like there's lack of information about disease and treatment. Um, and this can be very different depending on where you live, what care you're getting at your institution. Um, but something that's great in sort of reframing and looking at the, the positive areas of this is each of you are here right now. You are doing a lot of great information gathering where you're going to different talks and talks that are really specific or unique to your own experience and finding different ways to get credible and trustworthy information. Uh, so I've included a couple of more resources that I've found particularly helpful. But um, last year, there was a, a speaker that talked about, you know, do I have the right medical team? Um, do I need an oncologist for my care? And I, I just found that talk really helpful in terms of discussing who are the care team members uh, for uh, somebody who has thyroid cancer. So really talking through what it, who is an endocrine surgeon, what are their roles, what are their skill sets, who's a nuclear medicine provider, who's an endocrinologist, uh, and really going through all those things and providing a comprehensive understanding of that. I've also include some, included some of the talks that are happening later today but can be really helpful in terms of getting more of that information gathering and understanding um, different areas for disease and, and treatment management. Uh, another thing that I've tended to hear is feeling as though people can feel lost about uh, support groups to attend. And also wanting to preface that support groups aren't for everyone, as uh, some people really love the, the shared experience that can come with support groups. Some people really love the feeling of being validated where somebody else has that um, lived experience and you're able to uh, learn different uh, unique insights about how people might have managed their own uh, side effects from treatments or might learn, um, uh, might have lifelong friends that come out of that. Uh, so FICA does have a, a bunch of virtual support groups. Uh, I'm not sure if any of them are in person uh, post pandemic, uh, but the FICA website has some, some great resources there. And then also how to find a mental health provider. So with my degree being in health psychology, uh, health psychologists are providers that are have unique training in the, the medical field. So really understanding different areas of chronic illness and how individuals navigate that within the medical system. Uh, so they can be really helpful in terms of managing any ranges of emotions that are stress that can come with uh, the cancer experience. There's also some other areas uh, of consideration that I'd like to just point out. I've started to hear more and more about the financial stress that comes with survivorship and long-term care outcomes. So uh, really recommending, uh, depending on your treating institution, seeing if there's financial navigator or financial coordinator there that can help offset different costs for medications, or uh, if it's uh, travel assistance to and from, uh, treatments that can be a really helpful resource. Another area too is registered dietitian. So I've worked with uh, individuals uh, who have received radioactive iodine treatment and are experiencing different symptoms that are showing up afterwards. And recently at Georgetown, I've been able to interact with different registered dietitians there, and they can provide a lot of non-pharmacological intervention strategies to help manage any difficulty swallowing or with um, dry mouth or with salivary gland swelling and can provide different strategies to think about in terms of going to the grocery store and what sort of foods to eat 
We also know that Thanksgiving's coming up next month and that can be a stressful time if there are those uh, more salivary gland side effects that can show up and what do I do with these big gatherings with people and how do I eat and still celebrate a, a holiday that can be family oriented. So really trying to see if there is registered dietitians at your care institution and seeing if there's different strategies there. And then also palliative care. So for, for some individuals, there might be these long-term persistent symptoms that are really challenging to manage. And palliative care team um, are great for, for finding different ways to manage those non-curative types of symptoms. And then social work as well. I, I always refer to social work as uh, resource gurus. They are so knowledgeable about different uh, community-based resources. So uh, seeing if your institution has any of those as well. And then a couple other resources I'd like to make people aware of. Uh, so I've talked about this idea of mindfulness and I really like providing free resources if uh, for those of you who are interested in this idea of mindfulness, uh, can start to engage in. So I've provided about four different uh, websites that have very short mindfulness recordings to try and engage in. Some of them might be mindful walking. Some might be mindfulness right before sleep. If you notice, it's really hard to fall asleep. Maybe that worrying mind comes on and it's really hard to quiet our mind before bed. Um, and then also some self-compassion exercises. So finding different ways to, to bring about this, um, you know, softening of internal experiences that might show up and just kindness to, towards ourselves. And for those who uh, might not have a, a psycho-oncologist or a therapist readily available at their treating institutions, um, I provided several resources here to find psychologists who have expertise with health conditions. So Psychology Today can be a great resource. Um, you're able to enter your zip code, you're able to enter in um, uh, what insurance you have to make sure that uh, the insurance is covered as well as uh, health conditions. And then uh, some of the things that I've talked about today are in line with acceptance and commitment therapy. So there's a whole website of therapists that specialize in this type of therapy. Uh, so you can find some, some therapists there. Uh, we've talked about this idea of health psychology. So there's a, a whole directory of health psychologists that are board certified, meaning that they've completed the the most extensive uh, training and examination to really be able to comprehensively provide care to individuals with health conditions. And then we've talked about each person having their own unique lived experience as they're navigating uh, their own their cancer illness and journey. And also come part of that comes with how we identify. So I've included a, a directory for therapists that uh, have expertise and also identify uh, with these different um, communities as well, because it might not only be the, the emotions and uh, side effects and experiences that come with cancer, but also identifying as someone within the LGBTIAQ plus community and how there can be different layers of that lived experience with thyroid cancer or being somebody who identifies in the Black, Indigenous, or people of color community, and how those experiences are also tying into their experience with thyroid cancer. Uh, I also want to, to thank Gary Bloom, who's, I cannot say enough fantastic things about Gary and the work that he does with FICA, really appreciative of him. Uh, extending an invitation for me to talk with him, with you all today. Um, I also want to thank everyone in the thyroid cancer community. So everyone who is in this room today, everyone who is here virtually, I, I really feel as a researcher at Georgetown, but somebody who also provides 
therapy to thyroid cancer patients um, at a private practice that I've really been able to learn more from each of your unique experiences. And then I also would like to thank Dr. Graves and Dr. Jonkless, who are uh, the two individuals that have really introduced me to the thyroid cancer community. And it's been a really humbling experience. And uh, I've talked about the, the research hat that I wear. So uh, we've been able to partner with lots of FICA members. Uh, currently, we have a couple of studies uh, going on where we're uh, developing an informational support website to help with self-management of symptoms. And then we're also developing a web-based decision aid to um, help individuals make informed decisions about whether or not to receive radioactive iodine treatment. So if anyone's interested in participating in any studies, we have our uh, email address here. And then I know that I've covered a lot of different things today. Uh, so there is about nine minutes or so for questions. So I'm happy to take uh, any questions that people might have. So someone, it looks like somebody in the chat asked, um, when do you know you should get professional help to manage the mental uh, side? Uh, so I would say, you know, it really depends on, on the person. But if you're noticing uh, that maybe it's it's becoming challenging to um, manage the different roles that you have in your life, whether that's uh, being a spouse or, uh, you know, being a mother or a parent or uh, also managing your work as an employee. Uh, if you're noticing any difficulties uh, with uh, those roles and stress that's showing up and maybe lack of enjoyment in things that you used to enjoy, it, any of those things it can be helpful to uh, talk with a mental health professional. Uh, oftentimes when we think of uh, going to a therapist or seeing a mental health professional, there also can be stigma around, oh, oh, people that go there might tend to be really stressed or really depressed or um, have a lot of uh, significant uh, stressors going on in their life. But as we talked about today, the cancer experience is a very stressful, significant life experience. So it would make sense to want to talk through all of those stressors that we talked about today with somebody, um, even with the most supportive uh, support network, if you have great uh, immediate family or friends um, or extended family, it can be hard to get uh, that unbiased third party point of view on things to just be able to talk about what's showing up. I always also like to joke that uh, mental health providers try to work themselves out of their job because the main goal is really to have you start thriving in life and identifying the things that are most important for you right now in this moment to work on. Um, so being in therapy doesn't necessarily mean it's for the rest of your life. It can be you want to go into therapy to identify a couple of things to work on, and then you might decide, I'm okay at this point. I, I feel like I've learned things or process the things that I've wanted to, to process. We have an in-person question as well. Okay, go ahead. Ma, I feel like there are sort of, I think somebody else said, like the sort of stages of grief once you get this kind of diagnosis. And for me, I had a family member who had said, um, don't ring the bell. When you finish radiation and chemo, he said, I refuse to ring the bell. And I thought that's the craziest thing ever. Like I cannot wait to ring that bell. And then as soon as I did, and somebody took a video of me doing it and so showed the whole family, I feel like there was this decision made that it's done. And so people will say to me now, like, it, you're done. You're all done. And I have this very visceral reaction. Like I'm still stuck in the anger stage. I have gotten permission to start boxing so that I can express my anger in a more effective way than trying to hold it in and it coming out in little blips of, I don't know, frustration. 
Um, <laughs> but what would you suggest? Like, how do I correct someone in those moments when they say, because my answer is not good. My, it's not good. It's, it's pretty aggressive when they say that to me. So mm -hmm. I'm sort of looking for a better, kinder response to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, oftentimes, I, I recommend finding different boundary statements to make. So uh, when we think of boundary statements, it's uh, this assertive communication skill where, you know, you're noticing anger is showing up. Also, great job acknowledging what is showing up, uh, but also noticing I want a, a healthy outlet to express that. So I'm doing boxing. Um, but when we think about, uh, you know, assertive communication or boundary statements, it can, it can also be, well, that's, that's not my experience, or I feel that I am worthy to ring the bell. And sometimes when we find a boundary statement that's genuine and in line with how we feel, it can stop the other person in their tracks, sort of having them recognize, okay, like the conversation stops here, or okay, uh, clearly I've said something that has created discomfort and sort of embracing that oftentimes in communication with people who have different points of view or have not lived the cancer experience, getting comfortable with that awkwardness that can show up with these boundary statements of, I'm no longer comfortable talking with you about this, or uh, that doesn't capture my experience, or I am worthy of being able to embrace the fact that I've finished treatment, that it took a lot for me to finish treatment. Um, so, so hopefully that, that helps. It, it isn't something that will immediately have the statement right away, but uh, can take a little bit of sort of exploring. And again, that might be a great thing where if there is a social worker or someone at your treating institution to uh, get connected and find other ways to process that anger, it makes sense that anger's what shows up. Um, and I am doing both of those things. I do have a social worker. I do have a psych honk. Um, but I just was, my question was when the, when people are saying like, oh, well, good for you, you're finished. I have anaplastic thyroid cancer and just spent the weekend learning how bad it is. Like that it was even worse than I thought it was with the mutations I learned that I had this weekend. So when, you know, I have coworkers that are like, oh, but you're all done. Like you're, you're healthy now, you know? And I'm like, no, no this never ends for me. Mm -hmm. Like two years of immunotherapy and like, like this, this never ends for me. So I don't know how to say it to them nicely. Like mm -hmm. stop telling me I'm done. Like this never ends. Like there's a lot of people nodding behind me. Like they understand what I'm saying. And I don't, I mean, there isn't an answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And also thank you for, for clarifying that too. Um, it, it can also be just because treatment's done doesn't mean my journey's done. Just because treatment's done doesn't mean that compounded experience of what I've been through is all of a sudden done and resolved. There's a lot that I'm still processing and working through. There's a lot that's still unknown in this experience. Um, and it, it can take a little bit to come up with sort of the, the statement that is most genuine or in line with, with how you're feeling that really drives that uh, piece home. Like you said, um, uh, just because treatment's done doesn't mean uh, everything's finished or everything's absolved all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, if things don't have a cure and you're still yeah. on your journey, but are there then sites or places if people, some people really care and they just don't know what to say and they think that's helpful, but are there places we could direct them that would give them some guidance or support to like learn instead of her having to tell them what yeah. we're going through? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I know that um, Cancer Care uh, and the Cancer Coalition uh, Network uh, they tend to have great resources for family members and sort of learning 
uh, different ways to communicate or understand. And I know part of the, the work I'm doing at Georgetown, I'm actually developing um, a lot of recommendations for family members and loved ones to understand uh, you know, different areas to just be very aware of with the lived experience with thyroid cancer. As someone in the chat also mentioned, how do you support or guide the patient telling their family? And we're developing um, this whole uh, content area for how to share the news of diagnosis or different treatments uh, with family members, specifically uh, kids, depending on their age ranges and different books that you might be able to use to really help depending on their age uh, level too. Uh, to understand what cancer means or what this means for uh, the parents, uh, since oftentimes a lot of the books that are out there are for other types of cancer that really don't capture uh, thyroid cancer and what survivorship looks like or what side effects look like. Uh, so there are some things out there um, on some of the uh, more national cancer websites like Cancer Care um, but certainly I know at, at Georgetown, we're trying to develop some more uh, content to really help guide family members as well. So individuals don't feel like they have to find the energy somewhere to also do that. Uh, this is me. Can you see me? Oh, this is me again. But I, you know, family members and they're real invested in us. And it's like, really these friends or people at work or something, I think would be more like doing, not doing this stuff, but not understanding. And so is there, I mean, is there something for them? I mean, it seems like there's kind of two levels, people that really love you and will check these things or these people that just passing, try to help, not help, just, they don't, anyway, but they have to be motivated to want to look at something or. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it sounds like. Play and they'll hear it or something. Yeah. So it sounds like your question is um, more so uh, tailored to like acquaintances, including coworkers or, or people along those lines. Um, so to my knowledge, um, a website or a resource doesn't immediately come to mind. Um, but certainly um, when we think about trying to help uh, coworkers or more acquaintances come to mind uh, or uh, coworkers or acquaintances, we uh, I keep going back to uh, communication and, and thinking about um, what are, what do I need right now and when in terms of nurturing or what do I need right now in terms of um, the relationship and as some of that might come back to, um, you know, I'm not ready to talk about these things, or uh, here's something that might be helpful if you have questions or want to learn about that. And uh, Thyka might have uh, some resources that are uh, on there, but uh, I'm not quite sure specific to acquaintances or coworkers if there's a particular resource out there. Not sure if there's um, anyone in... Uh, the chat or uh, at the uh, conference in person, if they've used any resources that are, are helpful for coworker conversations or not. Uh, someone said you can establish the boundary with the acquaintance uh, that it's a lifelong condition to be managed. Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah, we're going back to, to boundary statements, um, just saying this is something that's lifelong and I'm going to continue to move through it and manage it. Yeah. Okay. I think we can wrap up there. Um, had a lot of good resources provided and questions answered. I don't know if you have anything to close with, Dr. Carr. I just want to thank everybody today for feeling comfortable to, to give your voice, to give your unique experience. This is a really complicated thing to talk about. There's so many different layers. So I just really want to thank everyone uh, who came today to learn more. Uh, hopefully there are elements of this where, you know, sort of validated your own experiences that are happening. 
um, but also just really want to thank each of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, I learn so, so much from each and every single one of you, and uh, I'm really appreciative of uh, the collaboration that we have with George, or with FICA and Georgetown as well. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for showing up today and, and really asking some great, great questions. I will reiterate that. Thank you to Dr. Carr for an awesome presentation and providing so many resources. And thank you to our virtual and in-person attendees. And this recording will be made available for anyone later. So thank you all and have a good day. Thank you.